Grace to you and peace from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We wade deeper into the waters of our Lenten journey today. Last week we witnessed Jesus being baptized by John again. Then we were whisked away by the Spirit into the wilderness, tempted by Satan. But even in that desolate and desperate place, we've only just scratched the surface. We look to the Gospel of Mark today, and it doesn't feel like we find the same good news we're used to. Things feel heavy. We're in the thick of it now, because today we start moving towards the cross, as we started to talk about in our children's sermon. We walk alongside with Jesus having a private conversation with his disciples, a crowd likely following them behind. The disciples know they're on the inside. They're at the front of the line. They know what's going on and what the plan is. At least, they think they know. In the beginning of their conversation, Jesus checks in with his disciples by asking, Who are people saying that I am? They answer tentatively, John the Baptist? Elijah? One of the prophets? Like a good teacher, Jesus helps his students dig a little deeper. Okay, who are you saying that I am? Meaning, what are you contributing to the conversation? That's when Peter answers for the rest of them, confident and sure he's getting it right. He says, you are the Messiah, the Christ. In the other Gospels at this point in the story, Jesus gives Peter a new name, calling him the rock, and professing, on this rock I will build my church. We don't have any of that in Mark. Jesus doesn't give Peter glowing accolades for knowing who he is. Instead, Jesus sternly orders all of them not to tell anyone about him. We have to admit, the PR plan of saying nothing about what they're up to won't be very successful. Yet think about it. Jesus knows the disciples are not getting it. They don't understand what it will take for Jesus to be the Messiah. If they start handing out flyers now, they'd put the wrong message out there. They'd share the wrong news with people at this point because there's so much learning still to do. So Jesus begins to teach them, saying, The Son of Man must undergo great suffering, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days, rise again. The Gospel says Jesus says this quite openly. Interesting that Jesus doesn't want the, message to, want the masses to know that he's the Messiah, but that he's perfectly fine telling everyone that he's bound to be killed for this message. And that won't be the end of it. Think about how this would sound to the people who left everything to follow Jesus, whose communities and families are occupied and oppressed by Rome. They signed on for a savior, not self-sacrifice. And Peter can't bear it. He grabs hold of his teacher, takes him aside, and starts rebuking Jesus. This isn't part of the plan. The word rebuke is the same word Jesus uses with demons who take hold of innocent people. It's the same word used to describe how Jesus takes hold of the wind in the storm. This is a fast and fierce affront. Peter is trying to school Jesus. He forgets who's doing the teaching. Jesus then turns to disciples and famously and publicly rebukes Peter saying, get behind me, Satan. Feels like we need to take a beat here, because that escalated quickly. We might ask, why so harsh, Jesus? The heat behind this moment comes from Peter not realizing he's tempting Jesus. He's doing what Satan, the tempter, the adversary, did to Jesus in the wilderness. He's laying out a path that sidesteps the cross and skips right to the triumph of Easter. He's putting Jesus up on a war horse, ready to charge the enemy lines. He's making Jesus the Messiah into the king of carnage rather than the king of compassion. In this instance, he doesn't know it yet, but Peter is trying to go before 
Jesus, beckoning Jesus to follow Peter's path and not God's. Jesus knows this is not the way. In response, Jesus continues teaching by turning and addressing the crowd. If anyone wants to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. How do we make sense of this difficult saying of Jesus today? What does this mean? It helps to take that challenge apart piece by piece. First, Jesus says to be a follower of Christ, we need to deny ourselves. This is not the same thing as neglecting or hating ourselves. Rather, we're to strive for a greater self than a self-centered one, a self that imitates Christ. We're called to place ourselves in relation to others, recognizing our interconnectedness. To deny ourselves means we do as Jesus did and give over power in order to empower others. So what does it mean to take up our cross? The people listening in Jesus' time were familiar with the gruesome way Romans executed rebels and others who went against the system. People hung on crosses along main thoroughfares and on hilltops like billboards warning anyone who would defy Rome. The challenge from Jesus to take up your cross would have elicited a visceral gut reaction from many. I imagine at least a few people in the crowd peeling off into the background, deciding they're not cut out for Jesus' mission after all. And really, who would openly walk towards that fate? Even for us today, in light of Jesus, no holds barred love for all people. We have to be willing to open ourselves up to suffering for the sake of God's radical, enveloping love. This is what it means to follow Christ. Contemplative writer Joyce Rupp reflects on Jesus' teaching, saying, Jesus wanted his followers to know that the journey would ma- they would make involved knowing and enlivening the teachings he advocated. In other words, Jesus was cautioning them, if you decide to give yourselves to what truly counts in this life, it will cost you. You will feel these teachings to be burdensome at times, like the weight of a cross. Jesus didn't suffer on the cross for suffering's sake. His death at the hands of the authorities was not a predetermined blood price exacted by God. The cross is what happened when Jesus aligned himself with those who were already suffering. And the cross is what happens when we, like Jesus, champion the poor, the forgotten, the broken, the oppressed. When we stand up to the ruling powers and call out injustices, our bold action will be met with resistance. Jesus is saying suffering is a byproduct of living out our conviction, that all people are precious in God's sight and refusing to accept anything less than that requires standing up for anyone who is discriminated against. Joyce Rupp continues, we can't just sit on the roadside of life and call ourselves followers of Jesus. We are to do more than esteem him for his generous love and dedicated service. We do not hear Jesus grumbling about the challenges and demands of this way of life. We do not see him talking a good talk, but doing nothing about it. He describes his vision and then encourages others to join him in moving those teachings into action. Still, Jesus' charge to take up your cross has also been twisted and used as a weapon. We all know this. History has wielded this phrase to mean abuses are part of our cross to bear. Let us be clear, this is not Jesus' message. Jesus does not condone mistreatment of any kind, especially when it involves lording power over someone else. So what we're called to do is turn around, repent, allow Jesus to transform our lives to go a different way than our own because God wants our whole hearts, the very center of our being. 
In this turning, this shifting direction to follow God's path and not our own, we're meant to follow behind Jesus, to let Jesus guide our steps, our words, our actions, and our days. This is what, means, what it means to be a follower of Christ. Throughout the Gospels, we're on a journey of discovery, finding out who Jesus is. If we notice, the more we understand who Christ is and what he came to do, the more we can understand who we are and what God calls us to do. From this point on, Jesus will continually point his would-be followers, including us, in the direction of Jerusalem. No one will go before Christ because Jesus is the one who enters Jerusalem on a humble donkey with palms and praise all around him and days later carries his cross through the same mocking crowd. Because Jesus is the one who goes willingly to a time of trial when he's arrested. And Jesus is the one who suffers and dies in solidarity with all the hurting and oppressed people of this world. Our Lord goes before us, bathing our path with light and truth. He doesn't ask us to take on anything he's not already taken on himself, even the cross. Being a follower of Jesus means living a life shaped and molded by the cross. Theologian and author Brian McLaren says to be alive in the adventure of Jesus is to hear that challenging good news of today and to receive that thrilling invitation to follow him as a disciple. The word disciple occurs in the New Testament over 250 times, whereas the word Christian appears only three times. I think it's time to reclaim the word disciple and to follow in that way. What does it mean to be a disciple of Christ? To reclaim this word and witness of a loyal follower of the one who goes before us. It's to live a cross-shaped life. One that seeks to serve rather than be served. That limits personal freedoms in order to set others free. And that looks to Jesus as our true north, our guide, the one who opened his arms to embrace the cross. Because on the other side of the cross is an empty tomb. And there, the journey is just beginning. Dear Church.